Thank you for the introduction. Uh, so let me, let me now uh, explain you why these talks should be interesting to you. Uh, so the mutual information probably well familiar to all of you. It's a very important information theoretic concept. And uh, uh, it's subtle, it's non-trivial to estimate. Uh, in this section, uh, in this talk, I would like to discuss uh, known difficulties and uh, uh, provide some, well, kind of known solutions or at least uh, uh, solutions you could have derived if you read some of the published papers. Um, so uh, those so of you who are familiar with my talks, with my previous talks, probably know that I like to give a very mathematical, uh, very uh, hard to digest talks. So uh, rest, rest assured, this one will be no exception. Uh, so just in case you fall asleep, like on the fifth slide, uh, here's a TLDR, or like uh, the more proper, too boring, didn't watch uh, summary of the talk. So what I want you to take away from this lecture. Uh, first point is that if you seek to have a lower bound on entropy, then, uh, well, not, not just some lower bound on entropy, but a very good one. Uh, what uh, it means for the bound to be a good one, we'll discuss later, but basically, if you want to have a good bound that you would, uh, would enjoy using in some practical application, then you can only have it when the uh, entropy is small. When the entropy is large, then uh, that bound is exponentially hard to get. It's, it's exponentially costly. It's, it's exponentially expensive for you. Uh, consequently, since the mutual information uh, is kind of composed of entropies, uh, the same sort of applies to the mutual information. You can't reliably uh, uh, estimate mutual information when it's high. Uh, otherwise, it would again cost you, uh, it, it's cost, uh, the cost of such an estimation, of such a lower bound, uh, actually a lower bound, would be uh, exponential in the mutual information. Uh, this is obviously not something you would like to have. Uh, However, we can actually come up with some good lower bounds if we uh, give a, uh, if we uh, step away from the black box assumption. If we actually know something about densities, uh, we would like to estimate the mutual information for about the random variables and their behavior, then things are much more easier. Uh, now, uh, you might not only be interested in lower bounds, but also in upper bounds. Lower bounds are good when you want to maximize something, uh, then minim maximizing the lower bound will in, uh, eventually lead to maximizing the actual quantity you're lower bound in. But what if you want to minimize the mutual information? Uh, then uh, a natural thing to minimize would be an upper bound. Can we have good upper bounds? Well, it turns out, yes, if we know uh, some, uh, if we know distributions. Uh, and uh, the final uh, thought is that, well, mutual information is not the only measure of dependence between random variables. Maybe some other uh, measures will be easier to work with. Um, and people have already uh, made some preliminary research in this direction. Uh, we'll briefly touch on that uh, also. So the mutual formation, what is it good for? Uh, it's, uh, it has uh, many different uh, equivalent definitions. Uh, the ones uh, I have here is just the difference of entropies. The mutual information between random variables x and z is equal to the difference of entropies. It's, uh, uh, you subtract uh, from the entropy of z the measure of uncertainty in the random variable z, the entropy of z conditioned on x, uh, how much uh, uncertainty there is left in z once you know x. Uh, it's a very intuitive measure uh, of information. Uh, it's also can, it also can be expressed in the terms of a well-known uh, divergence, the kullback leibler divergence, as the KL divergence between the join distribution and the product of marginals. Uh, so it's uh, theoretic information interpretation is that it captures the amount of information one uh, random variable carries about the other. Uh, it has this, uh, sits here on this uh, Venn diagram. Uh, so why should you care about mutual information? 
Well, its uh, nice information theoretic interpretation has led it to be a um, very useful tool, uh, very useful measure in many practical applications. Like for example, since we are all kind of uh, interested in Bayesian deep learning here, you can use it to measure uh, posterior collapse in uh, latent variable models like VAE. It's a very natural me measure that uh, basically uh, estimates uh, uh, av uh, that is equal to average KL divergence between the true posterior and the prior distribution. If the true posterior deviates highly from the prior, that means that the model uh, heavily relies on the latent representation, something you would like to have from the latent variable models like VAEs. Uh, conversely, if uh, this mutual information is equal to zero, if there is no relation between the samples from the generative model and the latent representation, then uh, obviously you failed to learn your VAE. Uh, you could have just uh, learned the uh, um, uh, explicit density model right away um, without any variational stuff. Uh, there has been a lot of applications in the representation learning uh, community. Uh, many works uh, on that that basically say that, okay, you have uh, some mm, complicated object X and you are interested in learning a representation that, care, that uh, captures as much information as possible that basically uh, encompasses all the knowledge there is in X. And uh, this is done by saying that, okay, there is an encoder E theta, parameterized by parameters theta, and we want to maximize the mutual information between the original X and the uh, representation obtained through the encoder. Uh, this is uh, usually not the, mm, the only objective, but it's like a kind of a regularizer that says that you should, uh, that the representations should be very uh, informative. Uh, you might also be interested in control independence. Uh, that is, uh, since mutual information is equal to zero only if and only if the random variables are independent, then this is a, a good tool to enforce independence between random variables. One application for that is in fairness. For example, suppose uh, you want, uh, you're like um, at a bank maybe and you give lo loans to people uh, well, you don't want to discriminate people uh, based on their race, for example, or gender, because this would lead to so, uh, social uh, instabilities, social inequalities, uh, and, well, it's uh, an unethical thing to do. Uh, but how can you actually guarantee that you are not discriminating based on these features? Of course, you would not include them in the model, but they can still sneak into your predictions. Maybe people of certain race tend to live in... Uh, uh, more poor regions of the city and you have this geographical uh, feature of, uh, in your uh, feature set. Or uh, maybe uh, through uh, th this information can leak through some other features uh, that you uh, don't, uh, don't know uh, to be carrying this information. So uh, a way to... Uh, so this is called the demographic parity uh, in this uh, field of study. And the way to solve this problem is to say, okay, there is uh, sensitive information C that we don't want our model to be using when it's making prediction Y for the input X. So we just want to enforce uh, that there is zero mutual information between the prediction and the sensitive information conditioned on the, all the, uh, on the uh, representation X that we know about the people that our model is using, uh, conditioned on these features used for the prediction. Uh, it also can be used in uncertainty estimation. Uh, it has been used in uh, information, in famous, uh, I guess, information bottleneck principle uh, to analyze neural networks. Uh, and there are many more applications. Uh, so how do you actually estimate it? Well, if you actually know uh, the densities, if you know uh, both the marginal density and the, uh, and both, uh, uh, if you know both marginal densities and the joint density, then things are easy. You can just form a Monte Carlo estimate. But uh, oftentimes uh, you don't have uh, this full knowledge. Sometimes you don't know any distributions. You can only sample from the joint uh, and this from, essentially from the marginals or, or from, yeah, from the marginals. Uh, 
Well, uh, then we are out of luck with the uh, unbiased estimate of the mutual information itself. There are some estimators out there, but they are not guaranteed to be either unbiased or lower bounds on, or upper bounds. They are just some estimators. Uh, we would like to be more than that. We would like to ha have some guarantees. Uh, in particular, we'll be talking about lower bounds and upper bounds. So for lower bounds, uh, I claim that uh, you can basically split it uh, in four different cases. Uh, so I guess just to remind you, uh, I'll write down here the formula for the mutual information in large. So it's uh, the joint density divided by the product of marginals. Or equivalently, it can be written in this form. So uh, in this uh, categorization, uh, I consider uh, four different defining cat uh, categories that basically uh, the, your ability to do efficient estimation boils down to uh, whether you know or not uh, the, uh, uh, the, the marginal distribution on Z. Uh, and the decoding distribution on X. By telling no, you mean uh, uh, having access to the yes, density Yes, function. yes, you can evaluate the density function. Uh, we always assume that you can sample from the joint and thus form samples from any of the marginals. Uh, so what I'm, claim, uh, what I'm claiming is that if you don't know the marginal distribution of uh, Z or X, they are kind of symmetric, uh, but we will uh, be talking about the marginal distribution on Z and conditional distribution on X, uh, just to fix the particular or ordering. So if you don't know the marginal distribution, then things are hard for you. Uh, but if you do know the marginal distribution but don't know the conditional distribution, then things are not uh, as good but still manageable. Uh, you, can have some, uh, you can have good bounds uh, there. Uh, finally, if you uh, know the joint, essentially, uh, both the prior distribution and the conditional distribution, uh, then things are uh, very good. So for upper bounds, uh, the situation is similar, but it's transposed. Uh, that n now you need to know the conditional distribution, uh, otherwise things are hard for you, uh, but uh, not knowing the density is not that punishable. So in a sense, you can see that these two are transposes of each other, uh, and there is, uh, and this is not a coincidence, of course. Can you speak a bit more about the situations when we can receive samples from the distribution but cannot compute it, or otherwise you can uh, compute it but cannot sample from it? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, for example, in GANs, the, g the generator, uh, basically the neural network that is fed some random noise and that outputs your, uh, you some uh, samples, uh, it is an example of implicit model. You can sample from it easily, but you cannot evaluate its uh, density. And uh, the uh, vice versa, S suppose you have a neural network that takes in an image and uh, outputs single uh, real valued uh, number. You can say that this is a uh, unnormalized log density. Oh, yeah, sure. Uh, so basically, uh, the generator, uh, the GAN generator, is an example of uh, this category. Uh, usually, you know the noise distribution, the inputs uh, to the generator, but you don't know the density of the outputs. Uh, moreover, it's actually, uh, it does not exist. Uh, it's uh, like a delta function along some uh, low dimensional manifold. I suspect the, the question was different. The question was uh, what to do if you uh, can evaluate densities but cannot sample. Uh, how this table will change? Uh, assume that we can sample from the journey. 
because otherwise we won't be able to get a reliable estimate for the integral. Yeah, well, if you don't know how to sample, well, things are hard for you. And, well, we may only say that uh, we could use at least uh, FCMC methods. Well, but then you pretend you can sample, right? Yeah. Sure. So, yes, yeah, so we assume that you always can sample. If you can, well, find a way to sample and convince yourself that uh, you are indeed sampling. Um, so, uh, any other questions? Uh, where did you get this table? Uh, this is like a summary of what's going to be uh, told next. Ah, okay. uh, yeah, th uh, this has not, th this does not follow from anything uh, uh, that I have told previously. But this will be following from uh, what I will tell you uh, in, in the next. It's more like my summarization of what's going on in the field. So uh, black box lower bounds. Uh, uh, let's uh, get to the second point of uh, the TLDR uh, list. Uh, why black box uh, lower bounds are bad. So the elephant in the room, uh, well, okay, now le uh, le let me present the uh, black box lower bounds uh, to you in the first place. So we know that the emission information is equal to KL divergence. So we can, to, to come up with some lower bounds on the mutual information, uh, black box lower bounds, actually, we can just use black box lower bounds on the KL divergence, right? Uh, I wrote down two of them here. First one is called the Nguyen Wainwright, Wainwright Jordan lower bound, uh, and it has this uh, this form. So f here is any unconstrained function. It takes uh, in your uh, sample a x and outputs some real value. There is no constraint as to uh, what form f uh, should take. Uh, and uh, th this uh, thing is uh, uh, true. Uh, this inequality is true for every x, uh, for every f imaginable. Uh, uh, y you can derive it using uh, essentially a friend hell uh, conjugate for the minus logarithm. Uh, for those of you interested, uh, well, uh, there is a citation. You can read the paper. Uh, a, a more tighter version of this bound is called the, the Donsker Varadan lower bound, and it uh, has this form. So basically, you can see that. Uh, well, you can convince yourself that uh, this extra term here is uh, bound on uh, this uh, logarithmic term here. That basically, the logarithm can be upper bounded by its argument uh, minus one. So what is this f function? Uh, the f is called critic, and it's just a variational function. Uh, you can use any function, and for any function, this will be a lower bound. Of course, there, there exists an optimal function f such that uh, this lower bound actually coincides with the logarithm, uh, with the uh, divergence, with the Kyle kind of divergence. Uh, we'll see what this optimal uh, critic is. Uh, but yeah, basically, this is a variational lower bound that you are supposed to maximize over f to get a tight estimate, a tight lower bound. Uh, and then there is uh, another uh, lower bound that has been recently proposed called the INFO NCE. Uh, NCE stands for Noise Contrastive Estimation. Uh, and uh, it has the, uh, this, this form uh, that you ha have one sample from the joint distribution. Uh, one sample Z0 actually is informed about the X. It is dependent with X. And the capital K samples are sampled from the prior. They are independent of X. And then you just uh, form this estimate here. Uh, f is uh, the same as here, except uh, since th this one was uh, in general KL case, but this one is uh, for the mutual information. So now we have to work with pairs of uh, random variables, x and z, to uh, estimate their dependence. <laughs> so uh, all these bounds, uh, however nicely looking, uh, will be shown, uh, will be shown uh, to be very poor. And uh, so the theorem that claims that this is the case uh, has the following form. It's, uh, it's called the formal limitations uh, theorem. Well, uh, this is how I call it. Okay. Um, and the theorem says the following. So suppose you have B. B is a function that takes in your sample, uh, lots of samples, capital M samples, 
and some delta. And so what is this B is? Well, it's a high confidence, high confidence, uh, distribution free, lower bound on the entropy. Yeah, we're talking about the entropy. Remember the first point from the uh, TLDR section. So you want to have a high confidence, lower bound on the entropy by essentially using only samples. You don't know the density. You don't know any pro actual probabilities. You only can sample. And so uh, what this theorem says is that there is, if you have actually this high confidence, uh, lower bound, that B is smaller than the entropy with uh, probability at least 1 minus delta over the draws of these uh, samples x from 1 to n, then uh, with high probability, this uh, bound, uh, th this mm, uh, lower bound b is upper bounded by something logarithmic in si sample size. So uh, you see uh, the uh, this B is upper bounded by the entropy, uh, which we want, but it's also upper bounded by the logarithm of number of samples, which means that if you want, uh, if this entropy is high and you want to have a tight lower bound that is also large uh, in value, then uh, this thing has to be large in value. And uh, the logarithm is known to be uh, very slowly increasing. If you uh, want this logarithm to be large in value, then the n has to be exponentially large in this value. And so th this so means that... What you meant uh, when you told that it's uh, yes. more easy to estimate entropy when it, it, it has low values, but it's still high... Uh, yes, yes, yes. yes. Th this is exactly this. Uh, this is exactly this result that says that uh, if you want to have a black box, uh, good uh, high confidence black box, lower bound on entropy, then it's going to be exponentially expensive. Exponentially expensive in the number of samples you have to use and equivalently in the amount of computation you will have to perform. Uh, now, the, how does this relate to the mutual information? Well, at least in the discrete uh, random variables case, you can... Uh, uh, we know that the mutual information is upper bounded by the entropy. Remember that the mutual information is the difference of entropies and uh, discrete entropy is non-negative. So uh, this is exactly what's written here. So if uh, the entropy cannot, uh, does not allow good lower bounds, then uh, so does the mutual information. Uh, otherwise, you could use the mutual information to estimate the uh, entropy. Uh, yeah, I should also uh, tell a small disclaimer here that uh, uh, this is not my result. Uh, this is a result from the paper that has been submitted but not accepted to the ICLR conference. Uh, so um, given that, uh, to the best of my knowledge, it's still unpublished, you should be taking this with a grain of salt. Uh, I tried my best to validate their claim and go through the proof of this theorem, but um, I can't uh, say that uh, I'm 100% sure that is correct. Um, uh, however, there is still uh, some other evidence that uh, this result does indeed seem to hold. And I will show you how the three uh, black box lower bounds I presented before uh, actually, how this theorem manifests itself in these three lower bounds, how these three lower bounds are exponentially expensive. Okay, so uh, let's start with the Nguyen Wainwright Jordan bound. Uh, re re recall the bound has the following form. Then the optimal critic, uh, the optimal function f. Uh, that you would recover if you were managed to, <coughs> if you were to maximize uh, this uh, right side with respect to f, would have the following form. It's just the logarithm of density ratios, the logarithm of uh, uh, b divided by the q. Now, if you, well, of course, you can in, you can't integrate these expectations analytically. So what you do in practice is you form Monte Carlo estimates. Uh, since you only have samples, right? So uh, you sample capital N samples from the P distribution, uh, capital M samples from the Q distribution, and form the following Monte Carlo estimate. You can see that it consists of two parts. The first part is basically a Monte Carlo. So yeah, uh, 
Uh, in this case, we're assuming that the critic is optimal. What I'm going to show you is that even if the critic is optimal, things are not great. Uh, probably it's not much better when the cryptic is suboptimal. So when the cryptic is optimal, the first term, this guy, essentially is a Monte Carlo estimate of the KL divergence. And uh, the second term, uh, as you might expect, uh, has zero expectation, but uh, it has non-zero variance. And uh, we'll see that uh, its variance is actually uh, the source of the problem. It contributes huge variance. Uh, the one reason for that is that, you see, uh, the first term was operating in the log density spaces. The log densities are uh, very nice uh, objects. They are well performing and they are usually n uh, do not vary too much. Whereas the second term operates on the ratio of densities. This is a very wild object. Whenever you see one in machine learning, you should be very wary of them. Uh, they might bite you with their enormous variance. Uh, and yes, indeed, uh, you can show that uh, if you write down the variance for the second term, then it's essentially uh, the he squared divergence between the P and Q uh, that has been divided by the number of samples capital M. The he squared divergence uh, uh, is, uh, ha has one particular property. It is uh, lower bounded by the exponent of the KL divergence. So it's exponentially bigger than the KL divergence. It's a very fast growing, quickly growing divergence uh, here. So if we know that the variance is at least exponential, then that means that this term contributes a lot of noise in both directions uh, compared to the, uh, to the first term. That means if you want to, if you want to prevent uh, the whole estimate to be deviating too much uh, further away from the um, KL divergence, from the optimal uh, thing, to, infor to ensure that the quantity is a lower bound, not an upper bound, uh, that is, uh, that it is lower than the objective you're interested in with high probability, then you would need to use many samples to drive this variance down. You would like to drive the variance of the second term as much as possible. And well, uh, this thing says that uh, the number of samples, well, this is the only thing you can control here to drive the variance down. Uh, th then the number of samples has to be exponential in the KL divergence. Uh, this is the example of this exponential cost of good uh, lower bound. Uh, yeah, so I guess, I hope I convinced you that the Nguyen Wainwright Jordan bound uh, is expensive. Let us now move on to the Donsker Varadan lower bound. Uh, so it has the following form. It's very similar, except uh, uh, here you have logarithm. Uh, so now th there is, th let's just, uh, yeah, the, the, the optimal critic is still the same. It's uh, the, the same function, the same uh, logarithm of uh, density ratios. Now, uh, let us just, uh, again, since we can only use samples, let's just replace the expectation with the empirical expectation, uh, the following form. Now, uh, of course, you would not notice and say that, well, wait a minute, this is not an unbiased estimate anymore. By the logarithm, uh, in the expectation inside of the logarithm prevents us from having an unbiased estimate. This is now a biased estimate and, uh, well, by the Jensen inequality, you can say that this is an upper bound on this lower bound, but it's, we don't know anything about its relation to the original KL divergence. It might be lower, it might be uh, bigger, we, we can tell f for sure. You can't guarantee anything, but uh, you can hope that uh, maybe if you take many samples, then this thing will basically converge to one uh, because of the law of large numbers, and the logarithm of one is roughly zero. So, no, it's uh, not roughly zero. It's exactly zero. Uh, in practice, it's roughly zero. <laughs> um, 
so it's zero, and uh, then you recover what you are looking for. So maybe if the number of sample of samples is large enough, then these uh, extra bytes we are suffering from is not that great, and it's uh, toler tolerable. So how many samples do we need? Well, bad news. Uh, uh, things of this form have been studied already, and uh, well, basically people have shown that uh, the although uh, the expected value uh, of this quantity. Um, so yeah, uh, the expected quantity of this bias, uh, the expected bias, uh, has the following form with respect to m, the following asymptotics. So uh, it's uh, decreasing uh, as as fast as uh, the variance of uh, what we have under the logarithm is decreasing. And um, as we know from the previous slide, uh, it does not decrease fast. It takes exponential number of uh, uh, values, uh, exponential number of samples, capital M, in order to drive it uh, to one at least. So uh, this hints us that uh, this bound is, n is not better, is not any better. Uh, it's also requiring exponential number of samples, otherwise, we would be suffering from high bias. So the info NC lower bound, uh, it's probably the one easiest to show that it's um, upper bounded by the logarithm. You can basically do this directly. Uh, the optimal critic now has uh, this form. Uh, it's slightly different, uh, uh, but uh, s since it's, um, yeah, it's slightly different, but. Uh, j just because it's a lower bound on the mutual information and not the KL divergence. And there are two types of radius of parameters here, parts F and uh, K, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, the, there are two parameters. The K is number of samples from the prior you're using, and the... Uh, and in uh, case, the optimal effort is the same. Yes. So uh, you can basically show directly uh, that uh, this uh, lower bound is upper bounded by the <coughs> log of number of samples plus one. Mm. How do you do this? Well, it's uh, very easy. You just move out the one over k plus one from the denominator. You get this term. And then what you are left with is uh, the expectation, uh, the exponent divided by the sum of exponents. Uh, this uh, this uh, fraction uh, that you are left with is between 0 and 1, so its logarithm is uh, non-positive, so uh, you can upper bound this uh, remaining part by 0 and uh, obtain the right, hi right, hi right hand side. Uh, once again, we have shown that uh, uh, this uh, lower bound, mm, interestingly looking lower bound, is exponentially costly when the mutual information is high. Uh, here I plotted some uh, toyish uh, empirical comparison. In the green line here, I have the Monte Carlo estimate. So yeah, this is uh, the one-dimensional problem uh, of um, two Gaussian random variables that are correlated. And their correlation coefficient rho yeah, is slowly increasing uh, towards the one, so that the uh, random variables are almost uh, identical copies of each other and the, the mutual information is high. So the dashed line here is the number of samples uh, used to, the logarithm of number of samples used to estimate. The kind of uh, threshold, once you cross, uh, once the true information, uh, true mutual information crosses it, uh, you can expect the uh, lower bounds to deteriorate. And this is indeed what we are observing. The blue line, the green line, the Monte Carlo estimate behaves nicely. It has a uh, smallish variance. Uh, and uh, when the mutual information is low, like uh, uh, less than two maybe, yeah, uh, smaller than two, uh, then uh, all bounds perform similarly, except maybe the info NC, which underestimates uh, the mutual information uh, when there is uh, no dependence. But as you increase the mutual information, as you increase the correlation coefficient, you see that the uh, info NC starts to be s to suffer well fairly quickly once the mutual information passes the two, uh, the value of two, 
you see that the deviation of the info NC bound from the uh, Monte Carlo estimates starts to increase, and, and indeed the info NC lower bound never crosses this uh, upper bound of uh, log k plus one. And for what about uh, when there's Jordan bound? Right, right. So for the Nguyen Wainwright uh, Jordan bound, you see that its variance is increasing. Uh, well, it does not blow up right away, but you can see that here, uh, well, if you uh, look closely, that here its variance was mostly the same as the Monte Carlo estimate variance. But uh, once the mutual information got bigger, then you see that the green, uh, the green, uh, uh, sh the green shaded area here is much smaller than the blue shaded area. There is much more variance in the uh, Gwen Vein right uh, Jordan bound. So for for random variables with a, a large variance of mutual information, we have a either very biased estimator with low variance or unbiased estimate but with an extremely large variance. Yeah, that's right. Yes. Of the mutual information. Uh, in this problem, I assume that I have uh, so. For the mutual information, I had uh, both uh, all the uh, densities, the joint densities and all marginal densities, so I can just e use as a direct Monte Carlo evaluation of the chiral divergence. Why then does the blue uh, bound is sometimes higher than uh, the real uh, uh, mutual information? The blue bound? Yes. yes. Well, because uh, uh, the NWJ bound is not a high confidence lower bound on uh, that means uh, indeed th the fact that uh, it has uh, it deviates it exceeds the true value very often is a direct uh, example of the theorem uh, you see that uh, with high probability well qu quite often at least you see that uh, the estimate exceeds the true value this is not something you would like to have expectation exceeds two or not no uh, no the uh, well at uh, no the, uh, in expectation, everything is fine. What's about uh, VD? Uh, yeah, I didn't draw it here, uh, but it's, uh, well, surprisingly, it was performing even worse than the uh, uh, NWJ bound. Um, I didn't fully understand uh, why it was happening, so I didn't include it in the, in the plot. Any other questions? Okay, now let's move on. Uh, yeah, well, but uh, then one might uh, question, wait, but uh, these bounds have been used in practice to uh, uh, actually achieve some results, well, at least uh, achieve the publications, right? Um, the uh, ultimate result of scientific... Um, <laughs> so why do they work? Uh, well, when there is a theorem, how can it happen that uh, there is theorem that says that they shouldn't work and yet uh, we see some uh, papers actually being published with uh, decent results? Well, uh, there is another paper uh, that's been out uh, recently that uh, has this name. Uh, it's also not uh, peer-reviewed uh, and uh, mm, maybe some of you will be reviewing it. So um, well, the only thing I'm going to tell you is that uh, in this paper, uh, authors uh, asked uh, the exactly, exa exactly the same question. Why do uh, mutual information estimators, uh, why do representations learned using mutual information maximization work so well when there is theorem that says you can't estimate mutual information uh, uh, reliably? Well, uh, they uh, provide several evidence, uh, so some evidence that uh, the mutual information maximization perspective is not the right thing to do, uh, not the right th way to see these methods. These methods might be working for a different reason. And they show this uh, by arguing that uh, first they, the tighter bounds, the ones with better critics, uh, better Fs, do not translate into better representations. Sometimes you want to cripple your lower bound with the inferior critic with some bad function f in order to get good results. Uh, then if you have a invertible representation, then seemingly the mutual information has to be independent of your 
uh, encoder, if your encoder is invertible, then it has, it, it should, it, it has maximum achievable mutual information with the original uh, random variable x. And uh, there is no, there, there shouldn't be any actual learning signal because nowhere, no matter which uh, representation, which encoder you use, they all are invertible and hence uh, all uh, possible, all information there is has been already stored. So this means that uh, the mutual information is, is the maximum? Yes, right? yes. Uh, although there is small technical detail is that the, sure. the, ma the maximal value of uh, mutual information in continuous case is equal to infinity. Um, not a very good uh, thing to work with. So what they observed is that uh, if your encoder is invertible, then uh, despite there, there being no uh, good learning signal, no, dis uh, no any meaningful learning signal, then the representations are still improving if you are training them to, if you are maximizing lower bounds to uh, maximize the mutual information. Although it's, 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 uh, Although it's already it's maximal. No use to, to maximize mutual information itself. But maximization of uh, it, its lower bounds somehow helps. Yes. Uh, then you can also consider uh, encoders that could be invertible or could not be invertible that has this uh, kind of uh, ability to become ill-conditioned, to become less invertible in some sense or harder to invert. and. Uh, uh, these uh, encoders learned this way uh, seem to be becoming ill-conditioned. Ill they seem to be becoming harder to invert, uh, and uh, this is also uh, th this also does not confirm with the mutual information maximization representation. Ideally, we would like our encoders to be more invertible or easier to invert uh, to preserve as much information as possible. So what they conclude with is that probably a mutual information maximization perspective is not the right perspective on these methods. Probably th these methods work, but for a different reason. Uh, they say that maybe it's the metric learning perspective that should be uh, used. So um, I'm not uh, a big fan of this paper, but uh, at least the, the particular result that tighter bounds don't translate into better uh, representation uh, seems to be interesting to me, and also it sort of confirms with the theorem. Uh, I like when things confirm with the theory. So, uh, to conclude this section, uh, I, I hope I convinced you that there are no good black, no high confidence black box lower bounds on the mutual information. Uh, but can we uh, sacrifice something, uh, one of this, in order to actually get uh, good black, uh, good lower bounds? Well, uh, I guess the only way to, uh, the only sane thing you could sacrifice is the. Uh, black box assumption. Suppose you know something about the distribution, and it's quite often the case that you do know something about the distribution. Uh, what can you do then? Uh, this is exactly what we're going to do now. Uh, I'm gonna introduce some uh, what I call better lower bounds. So let's uh, take a closer look at uh, what the mutual information looks like. So it's the KL divergence between the joint distribution and the product of marginals. Uh, but it can also be expressed in this form in more uh, uh, down to formulas or form. Uh, these uh, expected log joint minus, uh, minus expected log uh, marginal of x minus expected log uh, prior uh, POZ. Now we can cancel some terms here, for example, in this way. We can cancel the log marginal on x here and here and obtain the expected log posterior on z minus expected log prior on z. Or vice versa, since uh, the mutual information is uh, symmetric with respect to uh, its rent variables, mm. you can say that uh, it's uh, the expected log uh, likelihood, uh, the conditional likelihood of x given z 
minus the marginal uh, log likelihood uh, of p of x. Uh, now, all these quantities are full of um, intractable terms. Uh, we usually don't know all these densities, but uh, some densities are uh, particularly hard, hard to get. For example, in VAEs, uh, well, you, you know this density, the uh, log prior, but you don't know the log marginal, uh, you don't know the log posterior, uh, well, you, the, the same log marginal. So even if you, uh, if you are working in the VAE scenario and you want to evaluate the mutual information of your decoding distribution between uh, uh, latent representations Z and the actual samples X you get from the model, then you can't do this directly. There is always, always some intractable term that gets in the way, either the true posterior or the marginal log likelihood. So uh, there, there are two ways uh, we can evade the uh, formal limitations theorem I have uh, talked about before. We can either, uh, well, uh, basically the uh, way we go and do so is by using some knowledge of the structure of the problem, knowledge of the densities. Uh, then we can uh, avoid uh, lower bounds in the entropy. Remember that the mutual information is the difference of entropies and the reason the lower bounds we had before were so bad is that one of the, these entropies we, we need to lower bound in order to have a, a lower bound, right? So if we uh, deal with one entropy directly and the upper bound, the one that comes with the negative sign, then we will have a lower bound. Uh, so yeah, th this is uh, one possible direction. So um, here I outlined two uh, different but actually the same ways to uh, circumvent the formal limitations theorem. Uh, either we try to uh, avoid lower, in, lower bounds in the entropies, one of the entropies, or we're going to uh, use the marginal distribution in order to give a high confidence. We're going to use the structure of our problem, known densities, in order to give high confidence, uh, not black box, lower bounds in the entropy. So uh, let's go uh, with the first one. Suppose that uh, we know the uh, we will go with this definition of the mutual information. Uh, here is the entropy of Z, and uh, this is actually the conditional entropy of Z given X, uh, minus conditional entropy. So we do not want to, we will not be uh, lower bound in this guy. We'll as be assuming that this uh, marginal density is known, and so hence we can form Monte Carlo estimate of this entropy. And uh, this one, the negative conditional entropy, uh, we only need to upper bound it to have a good lower bound on the mutual information. And uh, luckily, uh, the upper bounds on the entropy uh, are very easy to get. Uh, they are obtained from the uh, uh, cross entropy, uh, the thing called co cross entropy, and are basically derived from the following fact. Consider the KL divergence between uh, the P distribution, the uh, intractable distribution that you can sample from but uh, don't know its density, uh, and some tractable distribution, Q, the one you know density of. So then uh, this KL divergence is equal to this guy, and by rearranging terms, by just uh, moving the uh, expected log P to the right-hand side, you see that the minus expected log probability of x is upper bounded by this thing. And uh, here on the right, you have exactly the entropy. So the entropy is upper bounded by this, uh, well, cross entropy, essentially. So uh, by uh, putting, by upper bounding this uh, uh, negative condition of entropy with cross entropy, one obtains the following lower bound called the barber Agakov lower bound for the uh, people who first, uh, apparently the first, were, were the first to introduce it. Uh, is it from my paper? 
No, 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 no. This is a very old paper from 2003. Not, not so old. Very, extremely old. It's like a pre deep learning area. Uh, the mine paper, the mutual information estimate, uh, to, to we're using the Donskir Varadan uh, bound. And, um, I thought that uh, they also used reward on that. No, no, no. Uh, th their bound was not actually a lower bound. They had some, so they had an upper bound on the lower bound, so uh, it's not guaranteed to be. Sure? Yes. Okay. Uh, Another uh, possible direction, as I said, is to give a high confidence lower bound on the entropy. Uh, but uh, to do so, we need to use some, mm, we need to know the density. We need some structural assumptions. And we, we're going to go with the same structural assumption this time. We're gonna, uh, again, we're going to assume that we know the marginal distribution of z. So this time, we're going to go with this formula. Uh, uh, again, it's the conditional entropy of x given z uh, mi minus conditional entropy plus the marginal entropy of x. So uh, it turns out if you use if you know the prior distribution p of z, then you can have a good lower bound, good uh, upper bound on the marginal log likelihood, and hence the uh, good. Uh, lower bound on the uh, marginal entropy of x. But why do we need to use lower bound if we know the, the marginal exactly? Uh, well, uh, we know marginal on z, but not on x. Ah. We could use the previous, the approach from the previous slide, and uh, one can see that they are uh, actually the same. Uh, this is just uh, an another way to see the same bound, uh, kind of the same. So. Uh, those of you who have attended my talk um, last uh, spring um, know that uh, I have proposed an upper bound for the marginal log uh, likelihood uh, that, has, uh, that can be generalized into this form. Uh, there should be, oh, okay, well, uh, yeah. Well, it, it's, OK, you can write raw hat here and here, but the KL divergence between the uh, normalized and unnormalized distributions are not well defined, well, wherever. So uh, you can show that uh, the log uh, marginal likelihood is upper bounded by the following quantity. Um, I, think, uh, I don't think it's uh, very illuminating as to what particular is going on here. It's just some uh, mathematical formula. Uh, don't pay too much attention to it. Uh, but what's important is that by uh, putting it into this formula and combining with the rest, uh, you can show that the, uh, the mutual information, uh, well, that is exactly equal to this guy here, can be lower bounded by uh, the following expression. Uh, as you can see, uh, there is only one place where we use the entropy, uh, the, 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 uh, the distribution, uh, P of Z. Uh, so we essentially, th this uh, uh, extra term here is the entropy, marginal entropy of Z. Uh, and uh, there is some mm, extra uh, addendum to, the, to it. Uh, now, let us look at this uh, multi-sample. Yes. Um, Equation calls for any uh, anomalized uh, marginal densities, yeah? Uh, so, uh, uh, joint so the raw hat here uh, is uh, a variational distribution that uh, sort of approximates uh, the joint distribution. And the Q is a normalized distribution. Uh, OK, and the second question, uh, does uh, this low bound uh, also bounded uh, by some number like uh, it was in um, in previous section. Uh, yes, um, you can actually because show. Th th there is th the same uh, construction. It is similar construction, right? But so yeah, unfortunately, I don't have this in the slides, and uh, well, this is a 
great uh, fault on my side. Uh, I should have included this theoretical analysis here as well. But you can s show that uh, this formula would need k to be exponential, not in the mutual information, but in the KL divergence between uh, q and the true posterior. Uh, between the true posterior and q. If the q is equal to the prior, then you recover the info in C bound. Uh, we'll show this. Uh, well, OK, I'm, I'm not going to show this, but I, I'm going to comment on that. Uh, so th th this bound can be made much better by learning an appropriate Q distribution. If your Q distribution is equal to the true posterior and the row distribution is also optimal, then uh, you can s show that the whole quantity will uh, simplify down to the uh, uh, to the posterior, actually, to the p of z given x uh, for any number of samples k. Any other questions? OK, well, uh, let us talk some more about this lower bound. Uh, it has this form, just to remind you. Uh, as it has been already said, the raw hat uh, is meant to approximate the joint distribution, the unnormalized joint distribution over x and z. The Q distribution, uh, well, it, it, it has to be uh, normalized, and uh, we also need to be able to sample from it. Uh, and it approximates the, the posterior distribution, P of z given x. Uh, so now if uh, we put k, if we make some choices, some particular choices in this bound, we recover some of the stuff we have been talking about already before. For example, if capital K is equal to 0, then the rows cancel out, and you're left only with the Q of z given x. Uh, this is uh, exactly the barbara gaka floor bound I have shown you a couple of slides before. Uh, and, uh, this, uh, and the fact that the second term is the entropy of z, uh, the marginal entropy of z, hints us that uh, the first term is simply a fancy cross-entropy estimator for the uh, posterior for the log p of z given x. Uh, that is given by the thing called uh, self-normalized important sampling. Uh, so in particular, if you choose the uh, proposal distribution, the q distribution equal to the prior, and uh, you say that the raw is equal to some uh, learnable function times the prior, then the, all the priors will cancel out, and uh, you will be left with the, exactly with the info NC lower bound. Uh, that, will not, that will no longer be relying on, the, on knowing the marginal density, uh, but will be uh, exponentially expensive uh, to be uh, a tight lower bound. Uh, there is some relation to the semi-implicit variation of inference, uh, but we are not going to get into that. And I think the most important is the last line. So this uh, unified model explains why my uh, info NC works for sure. Yeah, kind of. Uh, getting back to the uh, empirical exam uh, example we had before, this is slightly, this is the similar setting, but not exactly the same. Uh, so again, the dashed line here is the log number of samples. And uh, uh, the lower bound has been fixed for some particular Q distribu proposing distribution Q. Um, I didn't uh, optimize it before because uh, in this case of uh, Gaussian distributions, you can recover the true posterior exactly. The true posterior will be also Gaussian. And if I were to optimize uh, this distribution Q over parameters, uh, over its parameters, then I would rec uh, exactly mm, uh, recover the red line, the Monte Carlo estimate. Uh, instead, I'd, I wanted to see how the bound performs for suboptimal, uh, for fixed uh, values of, uh, for, fixed, for fixed proposals. Uh, and uh, here are three different uh, choices. Uh, you can see that uh, they all managed to evade this uh, logarithmic curse and uh, break this uh, log number of samples, samples threshold. Well, it seems that uh, just the threshold became a bit larger, but they still have some. 
Uh, well, yeah, they do. But uh, as I said, it now defined by uh, how good your, uh, your posterior approximation Q. So basically, the whole uh, thing of taking multiple samples saves you, gives you some uh, additional bits uh, if uh, if your KL between the true posterior and Q is equal to say uh, A, then uh, you can reduce this A uh, by log K bits if you use uh, capital K samples. Uh, can, can, can we use uh, some normalized ball for a proposal and uh, this will be quite uh, good approximation? Well, yeah, sure. You can, uh, if you use some universal approximators uh, for densities, uh, then yeah, you should be theoretically able to drive uh, this gap down to zero. Well, uh, it relies on these expectations, and uh, you so just can't. In this particular experiment. Uh, well, yeah, I guess, I, I guess, uh, yes. Uh, in this particular experiment, uh, I know what the actual mutual information uh, as a function of rho is, as a function of correlation. But why I did a Monte Carlo estimation is to show that the variance of Monte Carlo estimate is well. It's like the best thing you can achieve. So I, I didn't only want to show that uh, the estimates are good, but also to show that the variance of these estimators is comparable to the best thing you can achieve using a stochastic um, estimation. So yeah, you can uh, write. Uh, it's important to see that the uh, confidence bars uh, around these estimators are, well, n not that greater and very pretty much the same as the Monte Carlo estimate. OK, so this uh, concludes the lower bound parts. Uh, I hope um, you're not con you're this uh, enlightened you in some ways as to what, what should we do uh, when we seek to lower bound the mutual information. But as I said, sometimes uh, you want to minimize mutual information. Then having an upper bound would be great, right? So uh, again, let's uh, f for one more time see the definition of the mutual information. Uh, it's the difference of these entropies. And if we are now interested in having an upper bound, this means we need to upper bound the first entropy and lower bound the second entropy. Now, as we know, uh, good lower bounds on entropies do not exist. So uh, we would not attempt to lower bound the second term. Instead, we uh, will well assume that uh, we know the condition distribution of x given z such that we can estimate it directly. Uh, but just basically Monte Carlo estimate in the first term here. And uh, uh, for the second term, uh, we can come up with, uh, uh, we can use um, cross entropy estimates since we need to upper bound uh, this uh, entropy. So, yeah, this is uh, what I have said. Uh, so, the uh, mm, good multi-sample uh, cross-entropy bound uh, on this uh, entropy of x can be g is given by the importance weighted after encoders lower bound. So basically, you lower bound the log marginal distribution of p of x. And uh, since it's, uh, it's taken with the negative sign, then uh, you obtain the upper bound on the whole expression, right? So. Uh, you end up with the following expression, which is very similar to what we had before for the lower bound, uh, except this time uh, the uh, zero sample, the, the one that is actually correlated, that has been sa sampled from the joint distribution, is only used in the nominator and is not used in the denominator. Well, again, the Q is a normalized uh, proposal variation distribution uh, that we are supposed to minimize the right hand side with respect to. Uh, you can put uh, the Q distribution equal to the prior, and then the you will not be needed to know uh, the prior distribution. Uh, this uh, pr uh, 
Q and the prior will cancel out, and you'll be left with the conditional distribution P of X given X, uh, g given Z uh, K in the denominator. Uh, this is the uh, f the case where you uh, know the conditional distribution, don't know the marginal distribution, and uh, well, there is something you can do, although uh, this, the, this particular choice uh, is likely to be a very poor one, much like the info in C lower bound. Well, you can't. You see, uh, you, you need to know distributions on the same quantities. If you have a distribution of, of, on x given z, then you also need to know the marginal distribution of x. If you know the marginal distribution of z, then you need to know the posterior distribution of z given x. Uh, uh, well, because uh, the mutual information is expected chiral divergence. And KL divergence needs uh, to be operating in the same domain. You see, so here, uh, basically, uh, w in the, here it's written as the KL divergence between the joint and the product of marginals. If you cancel out one of the marginals, then it goes in the conditioning part. Uh, okay, so by combining the lower bound and the upper bound, uh, one can get this uh, nicely looking uh, multi-sample sandwich bound for the mutual information. Uh, looks very interesting, especially the fact that uh, in order to make the bound tighter, you are supposed to maximize the lower bound and minimize the upper bound, and uh, they are pretty much the same with respect to Q distribution, right? Uh, very interesting mm, detail. Oops. Uh, well, so. What about variance of the right uh, of the upper bound? Uh, well, I don't have any analytical uh, statements for that. Uh, empirically, the upper bound is mostly IWAE bound. Uh, importance with outer encoders bound. Uh, and so it, it's the same cross entropy estimator. Cross entropy estimators, uh, so we, okay, uh, in the formal limitations paper I have mentioned, people, they have argued that, uh, okay, just replace both entropies with cross entropies and this will give you a good estimate. Uh, it will not be an upper bound or lower bound uh, because it will be a difference of uh, upper bounds. Uh, but uh, uh, it, it converges very quickly. It, it, it's hard to say what the bias is, but uh, the convergence is like the standard for Monte Carlo. So uh, they behave uh, very nicely. Uh, and they are, well, they're basically uh, based on the cross entropy estimator, which is uh, widely used. All of uh, maximum likelihood estimation is based on the cross entropy principle. Uh, okay, so uh, now the last part is that, uh, is that we have seen that the mutual information suffers from the fact that it's hard to uh, reliably lower bound the entropy. Uh, but uh, so what uh, the uh, mutual information is, it's just the KL divergence between the joint distribution and the product of marginals. Uh, it's a very nice one, however, uh, for one good reason. Uh, this one reason being is that the mutual information has very good, very uh, easy to understand t information theoretic interpretation. It's very natural measure for the information between that one random variable has about the other. But if we uh, forfeit this uh, interpretation and uh, just seek some measure of dependence, uh, of the form dis uh, distance between the joint distribution to the uh, uh, product of marginals, then we can consider different uh, dist distribution distances, divergences, other than KL divergence. Uh, for example, one can consider the reverse KL divergence. The KL divergence between product of marginals and the joint distribution. Uh, one can uh, go even more general 
and say, uh, consider any convex function f uh, such that f at, z at 1 is equal to 0, then one can define uh, f divergence using this function f. And any f divergence uh, will do. You can use any f divergence to uh, measure the difference between the joint and the product of marginals. Uh, in fact, the reverse chiral divergence and the original chiral divergence are special cases of this family. Uh, or you can use uh, Wasserstein, say Wasserstein distance, uh, any uh, distance of non distributions. In fact, people have already used this uh, Wasserstein distance uh, measure. Uh, this paper has been published at uh, New Rips this year, so uh, you can go and read it. Uh, it's more trustworthy, I guess, than uh, most of other papers I have cited. Uh, how is it called, this is uh, Alexander information measure? Uh, I don't think the, well, maybe Wasserstein mutual information. Yeah, the mutual information is difference of entropies. The entropy is a measure of uncertainty. At least in the discrete case, yeah, well, okay, let's go into this discussion. Uh, uh, if your random, uh, if your random variables are discrete, if your random variables... No, this is important. This is important. Uh, if random variables are discrete, then the entropy is finite. Then the entropy is very... Uh, easy to interpret. It is indeed a very natural measure of uh, uncertainty. Uh, however, if the uh, if random variables are continuous, then the entropy, the differential entropy can be negative. Uh, it can be infinite. Uh, this is uh, very unintuitive. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, it's not clear uh, if your random variables uh, coincide, if a x and z are equal to each other with uh, uh, probability 1, then if they are discrete, this mutual information has maximal value of entropy of x, uh, which, is, um, a very, uh, in, uh, which is very meaningful. Uh, if random variables coincide, they have, they ca one random variable carries as much information about the other as there is, as there is uncertainty in this other variable. This makes a lot of sense. However, if uh, uh, x, x and z are continuous, uh, then uh, this mutual information will be infinite if they are equal to each other. And this makes no sense. There is no infinite amount of information. Um, although, so maybe in the continuous case, uh, we shouldn't rely on this information theoretic interpretation. I don't think there is uh, much of information theoretic interpretation. In the continuous case, I think you are free to, go, to use any distance you want. Uh, so yeah, uh, this is the discussion I wanted to have. To have. Uh, but yeah, so in the discrete case, at least, these alternative divergences would lack information theoretic uh, description, uh, information theoretic yeah. justification, uh, which is not cool. So. Uh, I, I'm going to talk about one of these uh, choices, namely the reverse scale divergence. Uh, that is uh, given, so the mutual information is the uh, scale divergence between the joint distribution and the product of marginals. Uh, let us see what happens when, the, uh, when we consider a different order of arguments, scale divergence between the marginals, the product of marginals, and the joint distribution. This thing is called the uh, Lautum information. The Lautum is a uh, mutual spelled backwards. Uh, very creative name. I, I like it. So uh, it has this uh, easy form. Um, it, it consists of two terms. Uh, the one is the expected uh, decoding distribution, the expected probability of x given z that is expected over the product of marginals uh, minus the entropy of z. Uh, entropy of x, sorry. So uh, this first term is uh, it's hard to deal with because it's well, basically a cross entropy on something. Uh, so I don't know how to reliably estimate it. Uh, but the entropy term, yeah, it does allow some bounds. Uh, well, we have already talked about uh, distribution-free upper bounds on the entropy and uh, distribution-not-free lower bounds. Uh, 
uh, we can use them here uh, in order to estimate uh, to, he to, give, to have a uh, bounce on these lautum information. For example, the lower bound uh, can be used using uh, can be obtained using cross entropy. Remember, we have uh, minus entropy on the previous slide. Uh, well, th this guy here is the minus entropy, so we can uh, upper bound uh, entropy with the cross entropy, and this gives us a lower bound. Uh, kind of, I guess you should, it maybe it should be called Barbara Gakov lower bound on the Lautum information. Uh, you can use uh, uh, IWAE uh, lower bound mm, to have uh, th this kind of uh, uh, estimate, this kind of lower bound, uh, the multi sample lower bound. Uh, in, th in the same spirit, you can use the IWHVA uh, upper bound to have uh, the upper bound uh, that would have the following form. Yeah, so uh, I guess that's uh, it for the Lautum information. Uh, it hasn't had much uh, practical applications. Uh, there is like one paper that introduces the Lautum information uh, and uh, one paper uh, that actually tries to use it, and I think there is one paper by Daniel. Okay, there was at least an attempt by Daniel to uh, put it in practice. Uh, so uh, it's not clear how practically useful it is. Uh, in particular, it's not clear uh, if this uh, uh, if this term has any meaning. What what does it actually do? Uh, but at least it's uh, one way to measure uh, dependence between two random variables. Uh, so as a, uh, as a pre-conclusion, I should say that, uh, well, basically in these uh, bounds we have derived, in these efficient bounds we have derived, we always relied on the, uh, a lot of the bounds were derived using the, uh, uh, bounds on the log marginal distribution, so th this, uh, the log p of x. If you manage to estimate it uh, to lower bound it, to have a good lower bound, then you obtain the upper bound on the whole mutual information. If you have good upper bound, uh, upper bound then you have a good lower bound on the mutual information. Uh, what we've been using uh, in this talk is this uh, process called self-normalized importance sampling. But this is not the only way to get good uh, uh, lower bounds. So you can use the cross-entropy estimator, but this one will depend uh, a lot on your choice of the distribution of Q. It, it has to be normalized. What if you don't have expressive normalized distribution? Can you improve it? Well, self-normalized importance sampling is one way to do so. But uh, there, are, there are other approaches. For example, uh, one can use annealed importance sampling. It's a much more complicated procedure. We will not be uh, uh, considering it in more detail, uh, but at least it is possible. Uh, so basically, the self-normalized importance sampling, it tries multiple dip different samples and selects the best one. Whereas the annealed importance sampling uh, takes whatever samples you have and tries to improve it in essentially using Markov chain Monte Carlo. And uh, you can uh, leverage the uh, power of uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo, especially gradient-based Markov chain Monte Carlo, and uh, have uh, maybe even much better estimates. Uh, it has a lot of, uh, it has a huge can of worms. Uh, it's tricky to reliably work, uh, to, to provably work with uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo. Uh, but at least it's uh, mm, a pr possible, promising alternative direction. Uh, one important difference, though, is that uh, the self-normalized importance sampling is uh, v very parallel. Uh, as you have seen from the formulas, you just e evaluate uh, independently many different samples, and you can do this in parallel. You can leverage uh, computational capabilities of modern hardware uh, like GPUs, to do this uh, very fast. Uh, in contrast, uh, annealed dependent sampling is sequential in nature. Not only it uses uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo inside, which is a sequential procedure, but also 
uh, it defines a, a kind of path in the probability space that has to be transferred sequentially. So it's uh, much less parallel and uh, probably um, does not uh, benefit from uh, GPUs as much. So that's it. Uh, let us uh, recap what we have been uh, talking about for the last an hour and a half. Uh, as was promised, I showed you that the uh, mutual information uh, is hard to estimate reliably, to lower bound reliably, because the entropy is hard to lower bound uh, unless you're willing to pay exponential amount of computation. Uh, actually, we have shown that the black box lower bounds on the KL divergence, the Nguyen, Wainwright, and donsky varadan lower bounds are bad. Uh, they, are, they require exponential number of samples in the KL divergence. Uh, if you actually know something about the distribution you're working with, say just one marginal uh, distribution, then you can uh, have much better lower bounds. Uh, which is actually interesting. For those of you who are familiar with the concept of copula, uh, you can realize that uh, the copula is the object that contains all the information about the mutual information. The mutual information is solely defined by the copula of the distribution. And the copula is independent on the marginal distribution. So think of it. Uh, the copula uh, is independent on the marginal distribution and uh, it is uh, the mutual information is completely defined by the copula. And yet, knowing the marginal distribution changes something. It allows us to have much better bounds uh, uh, compared to the case when we don't know this uh, marginal distribution. It's an interesting thought. So uh, the more you know about the distribution, the better it is. Uh, if you know the full joint, uh, things are much better. Um, we can have uh, upper bounds, good upper bounds as well. Uh, you can have multi-sample bounds uh, using this self-normalized important sampling and uh, by using bigger number of samples, capital K. Uh, as an alternative to the self-normalized important sampling we've been using, uh, one can use annealed important sampling, although it's uh, much more complicated. Uh, and uh, finally, uh, some pe people have started research into alternative dependence measures. Uh, maybe they will be much more promising. Um, in particular, those of you who are familiar with the Wasserstein guns uh, know that uh, there are uh, Wasser uh, in Wasserstein guns people have lower bounds on the Wasserstein distance, and uh, this uh, can be used as a lower bound on the uh, Wasserstein mutual information. Uh, we don't know if they are efficient or not. Maybe they suffer from the same problem as the Nguyen Wainwright Jordan bound, uh, but uh, this, still, this uh, uh, remains to be shown. No, but I think uh, this is exactly the, 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 the content of this paper. Uh, well, they proposed the bound, but they didn't uh, give any theoretical analysis, as far as I know. And what about uh, empirical results? Well, they do have some empirical results, but as I said, there is uh, uh, empirical uh, evidence for the... Uh, yeah, as usual, uh, I have blogged something, um, some more about this stuff. In particular, I have derived these IES-based uh, uh, bounds. So you are encouraged to subscribe, to share, uh, you know, and like, yep. all the standard stuff. Uh, that's it, thank you. Thank you.